Would you stand to your feet this morning and honor and receive this morning Denny and Mindy as they come to just share what God is doing in and through their lives this morning. Yes. And this is Gideon. Gideon Wilberforce. And Mindy will get in a little bit of his story later. But if we could play that two-minute promo video, please. In number 70, 18, a row against Wade. This is the actual case back in 1973. You would agree, I suppose, that one of the important factors that has to be considered in this case is what rights, if any, does the unborn fetus have? That's correct. And the basic constitutional question initially is whether or not an unborn fetus is a person, yes. isn't it? This is critical to this case. Yes, sir. it is. If it were established that an unborn fetus is a person within the protection of the 14th Amendment, you would have almost an impossible case here. I would have a very difficult case. certainly would. <laughs> So that case that you saw at the beginning, that was the actual case, and the whole case was based on deception. They were trying to make something legal to kill off the weak, the poor, the lame, to, to have a one race. Those who were dragging on society, they said, let's just eliminate and exterminate them all. So this is what abortion is in our land. The enemy is working full force to exterminate our king's inheritance. The children, over 35, or about 3,500 babies a day. Just here in the U.S., 3,500 babies a day. 24,500 a week, over a million a year. And when, when, we heard that statement, where's the moral outcry? Judge Scalia, one of the nine Supreme Court justices, he made that statement before he died. He says, you know, I'm not for abortion, but where is the moral outcry? And, and so when we heard that, I was like, Lord, this sounds like an invitation to the bride. This sounds like an invitation to the church. Where is the moral outcry? Where is the people rising up and saying, you know what? We disagree with this and we want this overturned. That we the people, us, because now it's been 45 years later and over 60 million babies have been murdered in the womb. And just in case you don't know, God's not okay with this. And so we, his hands and feet in the earth, we have to do something about it. That we get in the middle of this injustice and say, stop what you're doing right now and, and, and sign a petition. Your signature on this petition will be your voice saying, I disagree. And I, I know for a fact, I believe that God is watching and watching the signatures going, okay, I saw that. I mean, I count, but you know, but he's watching. He's watching the signatures that this could overturn Roe v. Wade and its companions, that we're going right after the throat of this thing. Right after the throw. Just like that God would use this like David Stone. 
And uh, that anointed stone drove it right into the head of this giant and knocked him off of his feet and then took the head. That this would be the same effect. That this would be anointed by the Lord to take this giant out of the land. So I would just want to say, we are in, in case you don't know, you know, we are in a, a Psalm 2 moment right now. That the nations are raging. There is a rage in this nation, but we are also in a Joel 2 movement. We are in an Acts 2 movement that God is going to face this thing with the church, with us. We're going to partner with him and undo what the enemy did. <clears throat> undo what he did. I mean, is this earth not Jesus's or is it ours? We're his children. So in 73... We made a covenant with death in this land. Nine judges got together and they said it was okay to murder babies in the womb. They said it was okay to do this. And it, you know, it, it's, it's funny the way the enemy works. He just comes in ever so subtle. What's it going to hurt? You know, I love Ecclesiastes 8.11. 8, because sentence against an evil work is not speedily executed... It's fully said in the heart of man to do evil. Wow. Yeah. It's like this thing just comes in a little bit. And then all of a sudden we look back and say, what did we do? Because you shed innocent blood in a land and you will reap the rewards. So what I want you to engage. We come to you unapologetic. Something has to be done. And so... We're gonna, we want you to engage in the story with us, our storyline, engage in what the Lord did. Mindy's going to go over the, the origins of abortion and share some of our story, and then I'm going to jump in here a little bit later, and just stick with us, because we're going to go somewhere. Yes, thank you. January 23rd of last year, we were laboring, we're from the International House of Prayer, originally from Michigan. But we were praying for the ending of abortion on the set. And the Lord gave me a word out of Ezekiel 21, 27. And it says this, I will overturn, overturn, overturn it, and it will be no more until he comes whose right it is, and I will give it to him. And I mean, I was like struck by the scripture. Overturn Roe v. Wade? It's like, oh my God. So that gave us fuel to go into intercession and say, God, what do you want to do? God, what? how can we overturn this thing? It's just... Me and my wife, you know. And so the Lord gave us strategy uh, through intercession, through praying and fasting and meeting with our intercessory team every week and, and strategizing before the Lord of how to do this. So I got to take the mic away from him. <laughs> no. He's a powerhouse. It should just. We're going to hope he doesn't get hungry in the next 15 minutes. <laughs> So we are the founders of the Moral Outcry. It's a petition to the Supreme Court to overturn Roe v. Wade and its companions. We had gotten a word shortly after the scripture word. Uh, somebody approached us that didn't know us. We didn't know them. And they said that every time they were in prayer, they kept seeing our faces. They knew us by face. That we would be involved with the challenging of Roe v. Wade. But she followed it up with saying, but I wasn't sure if you were planning to be pregnant. What she didn't know was we had just adopted legally four six-day-old frozen embryos. So I'm going to explain that in a minute. But because of that, it caused us to really go into prayer for strategy. I mean, when she said that, I got hot from head to toe. I was like, oh, man, I don't. No, we had been walking out the unborn issue and spirit of adoption for many years, but this was a whole new level. Contacted a high-profile attorney, asked him what he thought, how would we challenge, what was the criteria. Um, he started sending me things. Went into prayer, and on March 9th, I woke up went in my prayer closet and said, Lord, what's the strategy? I just started an Esther fast. And the Lord said, he showed me a vision. He gave me the vision 
off of a movie, Amazing Grace. If you haven't seen it, you need to see it. William Wilberforce rolled out his petition before Parliament to overturn the slave trade. Some say that he gathered 60,000 signatures on horseback in three months. His petition overturned the slave trade. So I contacted the attorney again and I said, this is what I saw, what do you think? Has anyone done this kind of petition? Everybody is doing a lot of petitions, good petitions. But has anybody gone straight for the throat? And he said, no, and this would be worth its weight in gold with our new administration. So we began to pray about it, fast about it. And within a short time, he and I put together, drafted the petition. There's five points of the petition I want to share with you. You can find all of it on themoraloutcry.com. The first point is crime against humanity. That's abortion. Second point is abortion hurts women. Scientific evidence that it hurts women. Third is there's scientific evidence now that it is life within the womb. We didn't have that 45 years ago. They're operating on the unboard now today. A heartbeat is detected by day 13. Safe haven laws is the fourth point. Every state carries a safe haven law. We are not asking women to have undue burden put on them. They don't have to care for the child if they're unable to. You can take it to any safe haven. No questions asked. And the fifth point is, dear to me, there's over a million families at any given time waiting to adopt a newborn. I don't have a lot of time, but I'm going to just scratch the surface on the origins of abortion in case you don't know. Of course, it was all based on lies. Norma McCorvey, who was Roe, was completely lied to and completely duped into doing this. After she gave her life to the Lord, with my attorney, went to the Supreme Court asking for them to undo it, and no one would listen. But abortion goes way back to the 19th century. It goes back further than that. But our origins of abortion goes back to the 19th century with the word eugenics that was created by a man by the name of Galton. He was the uh, cousin to Darwin. Eugenics is to wipe out the old, the poor, the handicapped, the degenerate, anyone with colored skin to create a perfect race. Abortion actually became legalized because of contraceptive. Every hormonal contraceptive on the market today is abortive. It actually has three functions. We're only told it has one, which is causes the woman not to ovulate. If she ovulates, then it causes the sperm difficulty to get to it. If that happens, now what do we have? We have a baby. And then the third one goes in where it's, the baby is unable to attach to the side of the uterine wall. Everyone knew that conception happened, or life happened at the moment of conception. It was in all of our medical books up until 1965. They couldn't get the pill legalized because they knew it aborted, and abortion wasn't legal. So they changed the stance on when life began. So saying, if that baby attaches, then it's life. So they got the contraceptive legalized, and then abortion was the next thing. Sterilization is part of eugenics, vasectomies, tubal ligations. We've all been lied to. This is just taking, ripping the covers off of this thing, of understanding what we've been told and what the Lord says. I know it's a hard thing, but I believe that fruit of the spirit of self-control is God's idea of conception. He created the marriage to bring forth a godly seed. He didn't ask us to shut it off at 2.5, though many of us did. I'm guilty. So I know that I'm only addressing a handful of you because most of you 
probably believe, absolutely, straight across the board, abortion is wrong. I'm fully pro-life. But then there's some of you that aren't sure because maybe abortion has touched you personally. Or you look at the stats of the children that are abused and neglected that go into the system and you want to say, well, they'd be better off, you know, back with Jesus right away. We don't get that decision. We don't get to decide who gets to live and who doesn't. Jesus is the only one. He is the one that is the giver and the taker of life only. The scientist that's in the lab creating for infertility, he's not creating life. He has no power. Jesus is the only one that decides whether that baby is fertile or not. The Lord told me, Mindy, whether a child is born or created from trauma in a back alley or on a beautiful honeymoon night or in a glass dish, he said, I'm the only one that says whether it lives or not because I have a plan and a purpose for every single life. We don't get to decide. We don't get to have an opinion. So, a few couple years ago, I was on an early morning set at the International House of Prayer. I sing, and our worship leader said, if you could just see what's beyond these doors. I instantly went into a vision, and I was standing at these large, beautiful wooden doors when they were cracked open, and I could hear giggling on the other side. When I looked in, I saw Jesus sitting at the back of the room with bubbles all around him. And he was playing with them. He was blowing them and tapping them and they're floating to him. He had a huge smile on his face. As I got closer, I could see that in every bubble there was a baby. And that's where the giggling was coming from. He lifted his hands and simply said, pick one. I came out of the vision weeping and said, Lord, what did I just witness? He said, I want you to loan me your womb. At the time, I was fully menopausal already. I had already gone through. I was turning 50. It had been 27 years since I'd given birth. I came home and shared this with Denny. <laughs> and his response was, I'm not sure why the Lord would want us to do that when we have fought so hard and stand in the gap for the child that's about to be torn from the womb or the child that's about to be born from the womb and needs a safe family to be adopted into, why would he want us to do this? What's the point? A few nights later, I had a dream where I was standing at my kitchen sink. I had something in my hand. My water was running. I flipped on the disposal, ran my hand under the water, and I knew instantly that I had just crushed an embryo, the earliest stages of life in my sink disposal. I woke up weeping and I heard the Lord say this, I'm so sorry, I don't know how it's to show you how I feel about this. He said, whether life is so small that the human eye can't see it, or a baby fully formed being torn from its mother's womb, he said, I stood before them both and declared plans and purpose and destinies and I grieve equally for both. Shared it with Denny in that morning. We had to repent. As pro-life as we were, we were still putting our own human value on life. Saying, well, this one feels, this one's about to take a breath. Those 600,000 frozen embryos due to fertility they're, are they really life? The Lord says he knew them. He knew us before he formed us in our mother's womb. He stood before each and every one of us. He has a plan. So we said, yes, I went through the process, found out I was fit as a fiddle. We were offered four embryos that had been abandoned at the clinic. 
Three boys and one girl, six days old. Every ounce of our DNA is there. That means there's blood, and there's life in the blood. This is making a case for life. The case that you saw, this is about, does the unborn have rights? Do you know that the embryo has rights? That women go to painstakingly (laughs) conditions to have an embryo placed in their womb because they know it's life? And we're debating whether a swollen belly is carrying life? So, needless to say, we said yes, and Gideon Wilberforce is the first of our four embryos. He's five months old. He's not my DNA. He doesn't carry my husband's blood. But he's mine every bit. My newborn adoption baby girls, eight and seven, they're every bit ours. I want to leave you with this before Denny comes up here. The polls are about to open. I want you, when you stand before that paper, that you remember the unborn. That you can set aside your political views this time. And just vote for the unborn. Vote for life. We are in a critical moment. Dr. King says on that video many years ago, it would be fatal to the nation if we did not recognize the critical hour that we're in. We're in it again. We're about to step into not a new season, but a new era. Thank you. Yeah, so this, this isn't a science project I'm holding here. This isn't just a, a bunch of goo of cells and tissue. We're talking about a human being. This is what Jesus went to the cross for, for human beings, right? <clears throat> and so the Lord wants to restore. This little boy is amazing. Restore the value of children. Just the, our value system for just even children. Buying into the American dream. You know, we, we all felt, was duped by that one. You don't have your 2.5 kids and, and have your house on the hill and all your toys. You know, it, it would just, we'll just cut this stuff all off and just stop it from working. We, we just need a, a reality check. They've been murdering babies for 45 years. It's like, Lord, why have we been unable to stop this thing? Why does this beast consume and exterminate so many babies? I mean, we're, this blood is on our hands. And you say, well, well, I'm not aborting. Well, you're not. But you know it exists. And, and we're held accountable According to scripture, when you know to do good and do nothing, it's counted to you as sin, right? James 4, 17. And he says in, in Psalm 82, how long will you allow this to go on? It, it says this actually. Verse 1 says, God stands in the congregation of the mighty, and he judges among the gods. That's us. That's the scripture Jesus was using. What well, does the scripture say? We're all gods? And then verse 2 says, How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? Meaning, letting the wicked do what they do without getting in the way and say, hey, 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 stop that. Stop what you're doing. But we've been all, like Mindy said, just brainwashed by this thing. Oh, that's that abortion thing. Oh, that's that abortion thing. And God says, yes, that's that abortion thing. You know, when... When Cain killed Abel, you know, the interesting thing was about that story is that his blood cries out. Cain killed
killed Abel, Abel's blood cries out to Father and say, Father, did you see what just happened? My life was snuffed out. Unable to fulfill the rest of his destiny. What God spoke to him, like in Jeremiah 1, before the foundation of the world, I knew about you, I formed you in your mother's womb. Predestined your walk. And then when murder happened, especially with abortion, I mean, pastor read it. Proverbs 31.8. There's another one. Proverbs 24.11. Stop those who are heading to the slaughter. Stop it. Who's he talking to when you read that in your Bible? Exactly. He's talking to you and me. Not only for you, but as a congregation. Stop those who are heading to the slaughter. So that was, oh, we stop it, we just get right in the middle of it. And I'll, I, I will never forget last year, October 9th of last year was our launch date for this. By that time, we had about 57,000 signatures, 57,223 or something like that. And we were at the Supreme Court, right across the street in a house of prayer, and it's like, oh, oh boy, oh boy. You know, and, and we got the whole stack there. My wife's name is on the top, and our attorney, Alan Parker, who Alan Parker, he's not just a your local attorney. He sits on the bar association with the Supreme Court. So he's got a little bit of clout. You can't approach him unless you're on this bar. So, so as these, and we got photos of it all. I mean, there's stacks and stacks and stacks and stacks of paper. And we carry this across the street to the Supreme Court. But I remember standing in that room just beforehand, and, and I'm just like going, oh, boy, Lord, I don't know if I want this fight. I don't know if I want this fight to challenge Roe v. Wade. You see what they're doing to Kavan Brett Kavanaugh right now? I mean, that's what's going through my head. And I'm like, and I'm just like, but my, I'm, I'm a child of God. Like, uh, Lord, no. And I just, something rose up in the side of me, and I just put my fist down, and I said, somebody's got to do something. Go right after the throat of this thing and tear this altar down. And so we did. I mean, we, we walked them all over, right over to the Supreme Court and filed them with the Supreme Court. We're at about 110 or 20,000 signatures right now. Yeah, I know. It's almost one year into it. And you're like going, ah, I thought we'd have a little bit more. I thought we'd have a little more signatures by then. We're looking to get a million. Why not? I mean, if there's 50 million believers in America... Why don't we have 20 million right now? I mean, that's what I was thinking. This is, wow, Lord. And I was like realizing how dull our hearts really have become with this abortion thing. We said, oh, is that abortion's just a word to us. It's birth control to us. And I'm sorry, there's some churches that get it, but there's some other churches that are just going, no, I don't see anything wrong with it. You know, with, with aborting babies, murder. And so, I mean, it's mine and Mindy's job to just come in and just, let's throw some truth on this thing. Let's throw some truth on this and let truth go in there and do the work. Because you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And then you say, well, what about this abortion thing? Why, this, I'm not the one aborting. I'm not the one that's doing this. Those other people have done that, but they, well, how does this affect me? And, and I want to read Psalm 106. Friends, I want you to understand, when this thing comes in and eats away at a culture, it eats away and eats away and eats away and eats away, eats away, eats away. And pretty for some, a lot of people in this room, we were just born into this thing. Just born into it and we just put on our coping spirit. Well, just cope with it. Well, that's just abortion. It's always been here. I assure you, God is not okay with abortion. Psalm 106, 35. But they mingled with the Gentiles and they learned their works. They served their idols, which became a snare to them. They even sacrificed their sons and their daughters to the demons. 
and shed innocent blood, the blood of their sons and daughters whom they sacrificed to the idols of Canaan, and the land was polluted with blood. Thus, they were defiled by their own works and played the harlot by their own deeds. Judges chapter 6, Gideon. Oh, the Gideon story. We know the Gideon story, right? Why well, my son is named Gideon, Gideon Wilberforce. God shows up to Gideon and says, Gideon, I've heard the people's cry because God told them not to do some things and they did it anyways. Does that remind you of a people? Don't do this and we just do it anyways. And so Gideon's hiding out in the wine press, threshing the wheat because their land is being completely purged by their enemies. They're robbing, stealing. They don't, so he's hiding out. The angel of the Lord shows up and says, Gideon, almighty man of valor, the Lord is with you. Gideon makes this statement. Um, if the Lord's with us, then uh, what's going on in my land here? Because if God was with us, this wouldn't be happening. And basically, and I'm paraphrasing here, this is my version of the story. We're going to read it later. I think it was interesting. God asked Gideon the first thing to do. He says, Gideon... You want me to come in and heal your land? I can do that. Do you want me to, I'll even turn your enemies against each other. I'll just let them kill each other off. If we find out later in the story. He says, Gideon, but this is the first thing that I want you to do. Before I come in and I'm going to bless your land, before I come and do this, I'm not going to come in there. He says, I want that Baal altar that your father erected in the city town to be torn down and burned up. The Baal altars back in the day, they used to sacrifice their sons and their daughters on the altars of Baal. They would do it for prosperity, fertility. All the, I mean, the firstborn on an open flame, on a fire. And we said, well, well, that's not what we're doing. Well, we're doing it out of convenience. We're doing, well, I'm not really ready for this right now. Well, I got a career ahead of me. I'm doing this so I can build my... I've heard them all. Well, probably not all. And so we say, okay, wait a minute here. So does abortion affect me? Because in the story of Gideon, they rebelled against God and they started sacrificing their sons. And by the way, this is over and over and over and over in the, in the Old Testament of these Baal altars. It's, it's, it's sacrificing their sons and their daughters to the demons. There is a da demonic force behind this thing, yes. waging war, trying to consume the prophet, the teacher, the evangelist, the fireman, the nurse. I mean, if he, he tried to do it with Jesus, tried to do it with Moses, I mean, this is a, he said, kill every one of them in the womb. We get as many as we can. This thing is a, a beast. This thing thrives on the blood of shedding babies. That's what gives it its strength. And, and we just say, we have to get in the middle of this thing. And just say, enough is enough is enough. You should sign this and get 10 of your friends to sign it. 20 of your friends, your sphere. Get everyone and cause this thing to go viral. He says here in Psalm 106, he says, it'll contaminate and pollute everything. So let's just do a check here in America. This thing has polluted and contaminated our marriages, our children, our schools, our nurseries, our religion, our churches, our food, our water. Sickness. I mean, you make a covenant with death. God takes that serious. We might not take it so serious because we love Jesus, you know. But, I mean, I'm telling you, just sickness comes in. He's like, well, why can't I shake this thing? I remember being in intercession. It's like, man, <clears throat> going after the Lord. It's like, why does there always seem to be a ceiling? Man, why can't we break through that thing, Lord? Why can't we break through that thing? I mean, this went on for months and months and months. And the Lord just said, because 
this shedding of innocent blood over this land, you made a covenant with death in 73. And it has contaminated and polluted everything. Our thinking, our morals. I mean, the morals of this nation, it's just... Uh, whoosh. And, I mean, anything that you can fill in the blanks. I've went to some graphs on just the internet since about 1973. And it's just amazing. You see suicide rate. Phew. You see divorce. Phew. Like, oh, man, you're really serious about this, God, aren't you? He says, yep, you make a covenant with death. Death brings all of its friends in. Sexual immorality, fornication, pornography. I mean, and, it, and again, it has saturated. And it, it's just like we live in such a compromise right now. Such a compromise. We want to have a solution. That's mine and Mindy's. We want to educate the bride and say, hey, this might not be on your radar, but I feel like the Lord wants it on your radar. Because if they're, one of the biggest questions I ask the Lord, you know, Lord, how come I'm not weeping over this when I know my son Could have been just a science project. We just bought into this cloning. We just buy into all of it. Do you know that they, I mean, there's merchants on the earth alive and running today, living on the blood of these babies. They live on the blood of these babies. And if that evil is not evil enough, they sell the body parts off. I know. It just, oh, Lord. Have mercy on us. And you know what? We cry out for mercy every year in this nation. We cry out for mercy. God, have mercy. Another th million babies this year. Have mercy. And you know what's so funny about it? I just dialoguing with the Lord. I said, you know what, God? We cry out for mercy every year, and you give it to us. You, you do. You give it to us. But yet when you're crying out for mercy, mercy requires a response of, hey, we're going to turn from our evil ways. Have mercy on us. We won't do that no more. But we continue to our same pattern. The same pattern. We are living in an hour right now that casual Christianity, when things, re you think Kavanaugh, that little, that was just a foretaste of what's coming. That was a circus. They, they own the media. They own it. If we as believers are not ready for what's coming, and that's what we want to get the bride ready for. 3,000 babies a day. Okay, Lord, what's the battle plan? He says, I want you to tell my bride to look into the harvest of these babies. Because we're not going to, when it gets overturned, and I, I assure you, he's going to overturn Roe v. Wade. And, I, and, and when that covenant of death is broken off of this land, I believe us believers are going to feel the hand of God go, well, there you are. Oh my goodness, because you make a covenant with death, it says, okay, I'm going to give you what you're asking for. If this is what you want, and my church isn't going to get loud about this, I'm going to give you what you're asking for. Then go ahead, kill off your offspring, kill your babies. And you see what happens. And we see our nation today. Everything you can possibly imagine has been contaminated and polluted in this nation. And I, I want to put the church right at the top of that. We're going to shift gears here, not too much, but we want to have a, a game plan here. You look at 3,000 babies a day, 35, well, we're going to build a, hey, okay, let's build a whole bunch of orphanages, and, and we'll put these kids in orphanages, and, and then we can throw some into the foster system, because that's overran, so hey, what's a few hundred thousand more? Yeah, I, that's what I say. Yeah, I think not. I say, let's get ready, church, for what's coming. Because when Roe v. Wade, get ready now, your heart. So when it does happen, or it might even happen now, it might even happen next week. Say, oh, I have room at my house. 
Yeah, I have an empty seat. Girls, scoot over. I have the privilege. We have a, Gideon's our fourth adoption. I look at adoption as a, a romance. And I don't look at this as something I have to do. I look at it and say, I get to do this. What an honor. What an honor before I get to do this before the Lord. That's what adoption is. It's a beautiful love story. You get to join the storyline of these children and baby that they reach their death. It's winning souls, right? Winning souls for the Lord. And, And we're just gathering. And again, oh my goodness. I want to share our story when this journey began. Adoption is so beautiful. You guys know this, right? When our Heavenly Father adopted us into His kingdom. No strings attached. Come as you are. And then we just have to be like-minded, right? He's a father to the fatherless. That means I'm a father to the fatherless. I mean, that's a, it's a no-brainer. When this thing gets overturned and all these babies at our hands. Oh, this is a no-brainer. Come here. Daddy's got you. Mama's got you. Oh, you have some color to you. Oh, thank you. I need that. I have a, I have a black as black grandson. So I can make these kind of things. Britain and Christian, you guys know them. Shiloh. Guys, I had, I'm sorry, I'm pacing like crazy. I'm just. 2009, God got my attention as a man of God. Crying out, fasting and praying. Really going after Jesus with all my might. Because we had just gotten our youngest of our older children. We have three older children as well. Eight grandchildren. I know. And as we were empty nesters sitting in our house, crying out, God, let's make a mark in the earth. Let's do something that no one else is doing in the region. Let's just go for this thing. The Spirit of the Lord shows up. We're watching something from my hop. And the Lord says, you want to make a mark? How about adopting a baby? And I was like, yeah. <laughs> I'm clearly hearing wrong. And I really, this was my response. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. Start over? Lord, I did my victory lap around the house on the first set. I did it. And, and I really could not get my head wrapped around this, but Holy Spirit would not leave me alone for three days. And again, this was an in season. Oh my gosh, so many stories in this season, but I got to make this brief. I'm running out of time, guys. So we say yes to this adoption thing. Three days later, I grabbed Mindy. Honey, I cannot shake this. Holy Spirit keeps speaking to me. He says, adoption, a baby, adoption, a baby. And it's like, I can't tell him no. And Mindy says, I've been hearing the same thing. So we grabbed hands in our 40s, empty nesters. God, here's our yes. We don't have any idea what this even looks like, but here's our yes. We threw God our yes, and nine months later, we had a baby. We take this little baby, we get her home, and said, God, what now? We, we did this. We got a baby now. I make a decision back in, or the Lord just drew me into just spending every morning before him. Every morning, and I've been doing it every morning for, oh gosh, it's been a while now, since 2005. So when I get little Liren in my house, I got a baby, and... Mindy says, honey, you're still running your company and stuff, and I'll take Liren at night, and and I said, well, I'll take Liren in the morning. I'll just go in when I want. And so we made it, okay, okay. So I grab Liren, and I pull her into my prayer closet. This is uh, 2010. I remember that commitment I made in 2005. Every morning, just you and me, Jesus, uninterrupted. I got Liren in my arms. I step into the room. I'm like, ooh, I'm having a debate with the Lord. I'm like going, oh, wait a second here, Lord. I double booked. I told you every morning till your return, and now I got a baby in my arms. I told you I was dull. I'm like, how do you feel about that? (laughs) 
the Spirit of the Lord ushers into the room and just says, just the weighty presence of the Lord says, oh no, Danny, you went from the study of my word to the doing of my word. I am well pleased of what you did. You have laid your life down to, for the least of these. The least of these, the least of the least, those ones who have no, you've laid your life down for that, and I'm pleased. He went on and on and on with scriptures when I was able to get the tears away and going, oh my gosh, I read past this stuff. Takes me to Matthew 25. Says, Denny, you know, when you feed her, you're feeding me. You know when you clothe her, you're clothing me. When you change her diaper, you're changing my diaper. When you give her water, when you bring the stranger in. I'm going to ask this because I didn't last service, but I ask this at every church. How many has brought a stranger into your house or even clothed a naked person on the street? How many in this congregation? Okay, we got two, three, four, five. Wow, this, it's usually one or none. And so the Lord was just saying, Denny, there's a movement coming out of Malachi. Chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet, or the spirit of Elijah. And he's going to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, fathers and mothers to the children, and the children to the fathers and mothers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. James 1.27, pure and undefiled. The only place where he says pure and undefiled religion is to care for them. Some versions say view. Just scratch that out of there. We're not going to go view Johnny and say, Johnny, it's okay. Tomorrow's coming and I'll come see you next week. He said, be a father to the fatherless. My father is in my business every day. That's what a father is. That's what a mother is, that we're, he's in our business every day. Yeah. I mean, I'm feeding Liren and I'm weeping. He says, I, you're feeding me. I was that stranger. You brought me in forever. The other scriptures say in John and Mark, they say, whoever receives one of the least of these. The least, whenever you see that in there, he's talking about babies and children. He's talking about the squirts. He says, you don't only receive me, but you have received my father in your house. I mean, I wept and wept and wept going, oh my goodness, Lord. To the point of one year later, we shut the business down and taking this message to the body of Christ. And this man was one of the first people to open up the pulpits for us. And we sat with him, he just going, when can you come? Yeah, the Lord's breathing on this. So we say 3,000 babies a day. We just say, wow, John 4 says, the whole woman at the well story, but we're going to go to the middle part of the story or so. He says, look into the fields. That's plural, S, fields. We got the family fields, we got the marketplace fields, and we have all these different fields because it's plural. And he says, Denny, look into the fields of the unborn. He says, tell my children, they're there for the taking. The field is full. They're white and ripe and ready for the picking. Just go get one. I was like, oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. And I got my four. I'm picking from the field. I'm winning souls for the Lord. In just a different way. It's like, I never saw that. You know what I'm saying? I'm a street guy. I really, I am. Winning people to the Lord through my company and stuff, you know? So, we're here, we're done. I'm over, guys. You know, we're in an hour, an urgent hour right now. We definitely are in a Psalm 2 moment. I mean, it's just the nations are raging. Things are raging. Systems are raging. And it's like, do we stand on the sidelines and watch the rage go on? But we say, you know what, we're just going to... Let's get in the middle of this battle. And it's like, no, no more abortion. No more murdering these babies. We want the covenant with death broken. Come here. Here, I'll take those blows, 
And let me get this one, and I'll take those out in intercession later. Come on. Take the blows for these babies. Get in the middle. It's justice. That was another word he gave me. He said, you tell my children. You tell the body of Christ, I want justice for this injustice in the earth. We're going to be held accountable for this. And again, not everyone's going to adopt. That's not, but man, we got our intercessors. We got our singers that are going to write songs about this. We have our money people say, here, I can't do what you do, but here's my money. Do that. Or pastor getting up here, you know what? The so-and-so family, they're about six grand short on their adoption. Get out your wallets. That's getting paid today. Yes. That kind of, I mean, we're talking about a human being. Who places value on it? I know one man does. I know one man. The son of the living God because he died on the cross. And he wants this injustice faced. He wants us to address this thing as one. This is way bigger than Mindy and I. Way bigger than us. So your intercession, your time with the Lord, uh, adoption. I know the Lord's already speaking to people about adoption in this house. So it's like, I mean, we get to do this. We need souls for the Lord. So I, I'll just pray, Richard, please. I hope you captured the vein of the Lord in this. Because we walk out of here and say, oh, that Denny and Mindy, you missed the picture. You say, wow, what's Jesus doing in the earth right now? I'm telling you, there's a harvest coming. And it may not be the way we were thinking. Oh, although that is going to happen. Both and both. You know, the great harvest, absolutely. But this is a subject that's dear to, to the Lord. That's what the whole upheaval is right now with Kavanaugh. I mean, this whole thing is about abortion. They don't want it overturned. But we got to be a voice. Where is the moral outcry? So, Father, I'm asking that you massage our hearts again and again and again and again. And we sign up today all over again. And say, Lord, we won't, not on my watch, we won't let anything happen. We won't do it. We're going to get in the middle of this evil and bring justice because you're a, a just God. So, Father, we need your help. We need strategy. Stir hearts, God. Stir families. Stir moms. Stir dads. We want to feel what you feel about this, Father, in this room, in this house. God, we ask that you do this in Jesus' name.